Praise the Lord. Well, it is a great blessing for us to be here as a Kampala campus. I think we deserve another hand clap. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for receiving us. Uh, this afternoon, as you've heard the reading, we are going to be sharing from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 1 from verse 14 to 17, on the topic, the power of the gospel to save all who believe. The power of the gospel to save all who believe. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity, Lord, like this to share your word. The Bible says that your word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the attitudes and thoughts of the heart. Father, let your word change us today. Let your word set somebody free today. Let your word renew somebody, Abba Father. And we are here, Lord. Speak to us and bless us to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The power of the gospel to save um, all who believe. Romans chapter 1 from verse 14 uh, to 17. Now the passage we have just read, uh, this short passage, is about a Paul's responsibility and passion to preach the gospel. That is what we see in this short, yet very rich passage uh, that we, um, we have this afternoon. So it presents, it is about Paul's responsibility and passion for the gospel. It is about Paul's passion for his calling, as we will see later on. It is interesting to see a man who had been persecuting the church and is now expressing his passion for the gospel. Indeed, the gospel has power. As we've been singing, power to break every chain. The gospel has power. And that takes the grace of God. A man that invested in persecuting the church, and even the way he turned to the Lord, he was you know, on his way. The day he, he, he met the Lord, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, dragging believers into prison. And now he is expressing his a passion for the gospel. What a contrast. And so what we see here is in verse 14, Paul begins by expressing that he is under an obligation to preach. In verse 14, he says, I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you at Rome. So he begins by saying that he's under an obligation to preach the gospel. And in verse 15, that is the reason why he is so eager to preach the gospel of Christ. Friends, this means that the apostle Paul has a responsibility to preach. The responsibility is from Jesus Christ himself. Remember, actually he says this in Galatians chapter 1 from verse 11 to 12, that the gospel he preaches is not man made up. It is not from any man. He did not receive it from any man, and nor was he taught it. Rather, he received it by the revelation from Christ Jesus. That is why he says he is obligated to preach the gospel. Therefore, with this gospel comes the responsibility to preach. Praise the Lord. Remember, our semester theme is receiving and proclaiming the gospel of Christ in a hurting world. When we receive, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel of Christ. Praise the Lord. So, as I share, I want to ask you a question. Are you proclaiming the gospel where God has blessed you? Are you proclaiming the gospel? Actually, in this letter to the Romans, when you look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul begins actually by expressing this passion. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, 
and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of Christ. And so to Paul, preaching is a call. And he must preach. That is why he is set apart. And he continues to express this when you go to um, Rome, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16. He says, I am compelled to preach the gospel. And he says again, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. This word woe, a noun, meaning that he is in trouble if he doesn't preach the gospel. He's in sorrow. And actually the Luganda version brings it out clearly. It says, Zin Sanze. It's not a good word. Okay. This is, Paul is trying to accentuate his responsibility to preach the gospel. And friends, that must be the same with us. After receiving, we must preach the gospel. Because one day we'll give an account. You and me will give an account to the one who has given us this responsibility. Praise the Lord. And so we must preach. That is why Paul says, what to me if I don't preach the gospel? Praise the Lord. And he adds again that I'm obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks. Both to the wise and the foolish. This means that the gospel is colorblind. And Paul is eager to preach the gospel to everyone, known to some people. The gospel is color, is color blind, culture blind. Does no specific ethnic groups. And does not choose the rich over the poor. I have seen people actually who only want to preach from where they, you know, they want to go and preach to places where they come from. And we've had issues with some groups of students here who always want to do missions in their home places. Friends, the gospel is for all people, poor and rich. And sometimes when you go out for mission, we are selective. We go to some homes. They say, ah, that is a Muslim. Don't bother going there. Okay. So and so is a Roman Catholic. So don't go there. The gospel is for everybody. Color blind, culture blind. God wants us to go to other cultures and preach the gospel. And we must not choose the rich over the poor. Many times we are tempted to go to the homes of the rich because we know we'll find a cup of tea there. We must preach the gospel to all people. Our responsibility, friends, is to preach the gospel to all people. Praise the Lord. And secondly, friends, we should never be ashamed of the gospel. You and me should never be ashamed of the gospel. And this comes out from verse 16 to 17. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Actually, many scholars believe that these two verses, verse 16 and 17, are the greatest in the entire book of Romans. And I think I entirely agree with them because throughout this book, this letter to the Romans, we see Paul preaching. Paul is preaching. And, 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 and he shows you clearly that no man can save himself. The law cannot save you. It is Christ Jesus who saves. That's why he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he says in verse 17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. So he's so passionate to preach because he knows that when he preaches out of, you know, when people respond to this message, they will be able to live right with God, but also with fellow human beings. Praise the Lord. So Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. This presupposes that during, the, during his time, people were ashamed of the gospel. The time he preached. And I can assure you that even today, some people are ashamed of the gospel. Why are we ashamed? Why are we, why are we ashamed to preach? Praise the Lord. So we should never be ashamed of the gospel. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to us who are being saved. Can you imagine that the message of the cross is foolishness? It is sad, but this is the truth. The gospel is foolish. The gospel is foolish to the lost world. And for that reason, the world is ashamed of the gospel because they are perishing. They are on their way to destruction. And friends, let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that the cross is offensive to the self-righteous. Praise the Lord. It is unpopular to the world and its standards. It's not popular at all. Somebody has said that the biggest danger the church has today is not persecution. It is trying not to be too offensive to the world. We want to babysit the world. Because we fear that we will hurt these people. This is what Geoffrey Wilson wrote. He said, the unpopularity of a crucified Christ has prompted many to present a message which is more pleasant to the unbeliever. But the removal of the offense of the cross always renders the message ineffective. An, inoff an inoffensive gospel is also an inoperative gospel. Thus, Christianity is wounded most in the house of its friends. End of quote. And many times, we want to babysit our friends. Okay, when so-and-so is around, you want to edit the message, especially the pastors in church, because you know this gentleman gives in church. So when, he, when I talk about polygamy in his presence, this man will not give again. They say, so-and-so is a homosexual. And so if I preach the gospel against homosexuality, he will never come back to church. So you are the greatest enemy of Christianity. We must preach the gospel. That is why Paul says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of Christ. Remember the gospel is Christ. Praise the Lord. It's the good news about Jesus Christ. So we must never be ashamed of Christ Jesus. Talking about Christ in our offices, in our lecture rooms, where we live, we must talk about Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And we must preach the word the way it is. If we edit, then we are the greatest enemies of the faith. So my prayer for you, my friends, is that you will not water down the gospel to suit some people. That you will preach, you know, sometimes what is hard to swallow. That you preach the offensive, but glory to those who are being saved. And let me tell you, there are two reasons in verse 16 and verse 17 why you and me should not be ashamed of the gospel. Let's look at these verses together. Verse 16 and 17. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This is the first reason. That we should never be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So when you keep quiet about the gospel, or if you edit the gospel, then you are hindering somebody from believing, from coming to Christ. Praise the Lord. The gospel has power. Hallelujah. The gospel has power. The word power comes from the Greek word dunamis. I see my Greek professor here. Which means God's omnipotent power to break through stony hearts. God has power to break through stony hearts and bring sinners back to himself. Praise the Lord. God has power to break through stony hearts. And let me tell you, no man can do this. No professor can do this. It is only the power of God. So there is power 
as we have been singing, there is power in the name of Jesus. This power can break. This power can bring back sinners to God. Let me tell you, before I got saved, I used to laugh at these people who call themselves saved. I used to laugh at them because I was perishing. You get it? I was perishing. And guess what? I was into drinking, and I was not drinking water, as you've heard before. I was drinking alcohol. Okay. I remember we used to walk long distances in the night to go and dance, to go and clap. Okay, we would clap, drink, and then fight over girls. But God has power to turn a man like me, you know, like I was that time, into who I am today. I think he deserves a big hand clap. Some people are not clapping. The gospel has power. The gospel has power. Let me tell you, no professor has power to turn a sinner into a preacher man. No professor. Let me tell you, that's why you find these guys drinking. They know drinking is bad, but they are powerless. They do not have the dunamis of God to take away this drinking. They cannot. They know actually that when they run around, they, they run after university girls, they're going to fire them. But they cannot stop it. Why? Because they do not have this power of God. And this afternoon, I want to invite you to this power of God. God has power. Let me tell you, when I was there, we would drink. And, and you know, that for us, you know, that was enjoying life. We were enjoying life. But let me tell you, God has power. I remember one Sunday morning, this preacher was preaching from the gospel according to Matthew verse, chapter 11 and verse 28, that come to me, all of you, who are weary and laden, and I'll give you rest. That word spoke to me. The word of God is powerful. It spoke to me, and I came. God penetrated into my heart. Praise the Lord. I used to laugh at people who, you know, pray, who fast. But here I am today. God has power to bring back a lost sinner. And let me tell you, no man can change himself. No man can change himself. God has to ignite the dynamite, his power. Praise the Lord. God must ignite his power. That's why Paul writes still in this same letter, the letter to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 6. Paul writes and says that, while we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Let me tell you, you and me are powerless. Okay? It is only Christ that makes us strong. Praise the Lord. It is only Christ that takes away the power of sin. And I want to invite you to this power. Let me tell you, if you're a professor, you're a student here, I can assure you, you are powerless. And you cannot take away this sin from yourself. Praise the Lord. I need to, uh, you, you need to come to, to, to Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who has power. Who has power to take away sin. Who has power to transform a drunkard into a preacher man. A man full of the spirit of Uganda Waraj, now full of the spirit of God. It is only God. And those of us that are involved in preaching the gospel, this is the good news. That as we proclaim the gospel, we need to trust the Lord. It is the Lord who saves. The Lord has power. Sometimes you preach and, and, and you feel, you know, you are speaking to stones. You're not speaking to human beings. Okay? But let me tell you, God has power. God has power to change. Recently, we were coming from a mission. We are coming from Bali. So we stopped in Jinja to have lunch with the students. And uh, I think there is a, a restaurant, uh, it is I think on Gabula Road. It is called Simple Restaurant. So we stopped there to have lunch. When we stopped after having our lunch, this man came. When the man came, he gave us a ticket okay, for parking. So I had to pay for 500. I paid for the ticket. I gave him a 10,000 note. After giving him the 10,000 note, he, he had to give me back five, 500, okay, 5,500. 
So instead, he gave me six 500. So I got the 1,000 and gave it back to him. And he said, he said, no, it is not true. I cannot make a mistake. I have been doing this for a long time. So I told him, you check. And afterwards, he realized that he had made a mistake. I am talking about the power of the gospel. I preached the gospel that day. So the man asked me, he, he realized that he has made a mistake. He asked me, who are you? I tell him, uh, my name is not very important, but one thing I can, I can tell you, Jesus saved me. I was a thief, I was a drunkard. After telling him that, he said, by the way, I have been thinking about getting saved. How can one get saved? So I tell him, we, you can get saved now. I did not quote a single verse from the Bible. It took us two minutes. The man confessed. And I connected him to a student who comes from that region. Praise the Lord. That is the power of the gospel. <laughs> Preach the gospel. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is powerful. Secondly, why we should never be ashamed of the gospel? The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. This gospel reveals the righteousness of of God. In verse 17, the Bible says, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from, uh, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. In the gospel, God reveals true righteousness. Righteousness does not originate within man, but from God. Praise the Lord. It does not originate from man, but from God. Let me tell you, before I got saved, I tried to be a good man, but I couldn't on my own. I couldn't, you know, because my father was the choir master in the church. So I tried, I tried to build on his legacy, but I couldn't. I couldn't until I came to this Jesus myself, and he changed me. Praise the Lord. And I, I didn't tell you, by the way, before I got saved, I was a border, border cyclist, and I used to cheat people. Okay? We had a system. We would ask people to first pay money before setting off. Somebody gives you money, you go and fuel. Okay? So one day this lady gave me money. I didn't know she was tricking me. She gave me money. And when we reached where we were going, she also gave me money. I kept quiet. So one time she came home and told my father, your son is a thief. <laughs> you get it? But now I want you to compare the two examples with a recent one in Ginger. This man gives me an extra 1,000 and I give it back to him. The power of the gospel. And in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. Before salvation, People have a way of justifying themselves. You need to know. People try to justify themselves by creating a standard they think makes them acceptable before God. You know, for me, I don't drink. You know, for me, I have one way. For me, I give in the church. But they have never accepted. They have never believed. They have never confessed. You get it. So they try to come up with a standard they think is acceptable before God. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. He says, what is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Remember, Paul was a land fellow. You know, he was a land fellow, a man that was advancing in the law. And he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Praise the Lord. And so, friends, righteousness comes to us through faith. 
This means you have to, to believe. You have to say yes to this gospel. You have to respond to the gospel. You have to say yes to the gospel. As opposed to responding to the world and its standards, we must go to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Then, as the verse continues, this righteousness begins to show itself through the way we live. Praise the Lord. This righteousness begins to show itself through the way we live. Praise the Lord. And you've had people who say, for me, I believed. That is all. James writes again and says, faith without actions is dead. Now, because the gospel has power, when you believe, this power begins to work in your life and you, th there will be change in the way you live. Praise the Lord. If you were a thief, you stop stealing. You cannot say, for me, I believe, but you know, I am living in the grace so I can keep stealing. Don't deceive yourself. You need to go to Jesus. Jesus has power. And when I'm talking about this Jesus, I don't just have information about Jesus. No. I have seen this Jesus. I have experienced the Jesus I am talking about. I have seen him work in my life. Praise the Lord. Without this Jesus, I am not intimidating you, but I would be dead. Because as you've heard, Two of my friends are now in prison. These are people, okay? I used to work with at the border border. They are in prison. One of them killed somebody. The other was stealing border border. And recently, my brother went to the village and he told me, you know your friend sent you greetings. I asked him who. He mentioned the name and he said, but the way he was walking, eh, he's, I think he's about to die. That's what he told me. And this was somebody energetic. You get it? Energetic. But let me tell you, even that energy you have as a young man cannot give you righteousness. It cannot. Even that brain you think for you, you enough, knowledge is enough for you. Let me tell you, knowledge will lead you only to destruction. You need to come to this Jesus. You need to have fellowship with him. You need to encounter Jesus and there will be change in your life. So friends, you have heard the gospel. The gospel is powerful. And you can only be saved when you say yes to this gospel. I have seen the gospel work in my life. Remember, you cannot save yourself. No man can save you. Not even your parents can save you. No. It is this Jesus I am talking about. And you cannot get this righteousness unless you say yes to the gospel. Let us conclude in prayer. I want you to meditate on your life. If you have believed and if you have not believed, take a moment and reflect on your life. And maybe you have not said yes to the gospel. You have not said yes to Jesus. You have not responded to this gospel. God wants you to respond. And then we have another category of people who have believed but have been quiet. They have received, but they have not gone out to give what they have received. Maybe you're a professor here, you're a believer, but you never talk about Christ before your students. Think about the way you have lived. And for some of us who have not, if you are here and you have never responded to this gospel, I want to give you an opportunity. If you are here, you want to say yes to this gospel. You want to say yes to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity. Anybody like that? I want to give you an opportunity. Is there any person who says, today I want to receive Jesus. I want Jesus to come into my life, be my Lord and Savior. Anybody like that, you can put up your hand. I'll pray with you. Any person like that? Okay, let's conclude in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the way you have challenged us. 
the word says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, so that the servant of God may be equipped for every good work and service. Lord, we have heard your word. Thank you for rebuking us. Thank you for teaching us. And thank you for correcting us, Lord. Lord, after hearing this word, I pray that you empower us by your spirit that we'll be determined to reach out to somebody because the gospel has no boundaries. That will reach out our students, that will reach out even to our lecturers, that will reach out to our classmates, will reach out to those people who are perishing. Give us the boldness, Lord, the boldness you gave Paul, that we will be determined to share this gospel. Father, and if there is anybody here who has received you, but they have been lukewarm, I pray in the name of Jesus that you reignite them, O oh God, that your dunamis will work in us all, that will be on fire again for you, Lord, that will go out with a yearning to tell the hurting world about you, Lord. That will be like the Samaritan woman because when she went to the town of Samaria, the Bible says many people believed. That will be like Paul, a man that was determined to preach the gospel season and out of season. That will not keep quiet about you. Lord, we are sorry where we have not proclaimed your name. We are sorry the many times we have tried to preach a message that is not offensive. We have tried to edit your word to suit some people. We are sorry, Lord. Help us, Lord. Give us the boldness, the courage, Lord, to speak the truth. And this truth, Lord, that you will set your people free. We give you glory. We give you honor. To you alone be the glory now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen.